Welcome, everyone. I am here today with Clarissa Dolphin, an amazing astrologer based out of L.A. Clarissa, what do you want people to know about you and your work with astrology? Um, That I'm a hybrid freak astrologer. What does that mean? <laughs> hybrid yeah. freak. <laughs> no, that was the, actually like the worst joke ever. Sorry to like open up our dialogue with that. Well, I know you work with vibes. So let's start with the vibes, yeah. right? I wouldn't say hybrid yes. freak. I would be like vibey freak. Like what is vibrational <laughs> astrology? I think you are the first person to really, pr I know that our colleagues practice that, but you're the first person to truly open my eyes to this branch of astrology. So what is oh. vibrational astrology? Well, thank you for asking, Jen. Um, it is synonymous with harmonic astrology, number one. Um, it is also very, very modern types of relationship to what the actual natal chart is. Um, so instead of it just being like a, a topographical map connecting, you know, terrestrial beings, you and I, to space time like that's what a natal chart is a harmonic chart or a vibrational chart actually takes us into kind of quantum worlds like the infinite um and the way to kind of calibrate that and to, to calculate it interpret it etc is literally through the aspect it's aspect centric it's not literally like the sky doesn't exist in harmonics so mm. like the Zodiac takes like a total back seat. It's probably like 1% of what we do. That's, That's amazing. Like, yeah. So I hope that kind of like gave like something to your question. Thoughts? <laughs> that is such a, like, even when you say the sky doesn't exist, I'm thinking you're right. You know, in a way we are this speck of, of dust in the middle of this all that's a German word for the universe. <laughs> We're just mm -hmm. this like cosmonautical, you know, marble hanging around. And what we see is the sky is a figment of our atmosphere, right? Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's what I heard you say is like the sky <laughs> is made up. Okay, so now we're entering like whole new territories of awesomeness because like in this context of the sky is made up right and this like we're like this quantum particle of the all etc this is the type of this is why i love being a harmonic astrologer and on this cutting edge because we need to start thinking about that as astrologers as we um and humans as we enter like space travel because we cannot bring our terrestrial zodiac with us when humans are being born in on Mars, when humans are being born in spacecrafts, like anyway, exactly. have you ever come across a text that talks about what astrology would be like from the moon or Mars? No, please tell me all about it. No, I haven't either yet. I'm sure there's something out there mm -hmm. somewhere. Me and might have it here. I have in at the celestial arts education library buried in some yeah. of the books that we still have to go through but i'm thinking i had a question just yesterday from a local seattle palm reader named divine hand jim he said jen what's the role of the earth in astrology do you know what the role of earth in the chart is from the harmonic perspective no that's something that we still have to research but what is that branch of astrology that actually does consider earth as a planet it was in a recent um, Mountain Astrologer magazine edition. I yeah, know Chrissy was, Blaze yeah. wrote about it. And basically, yes. the like, you can always find the Earth if it's the exact opposite degree of your sun. Because on Earth, we're looking out into the Zodiac. That 1%. Right. <laughs> that that yeah. you consider. And so the position of the sun is is relative to Earth. So the Earth would be the opposite point from the sun interesting nevertheless i want to go back to basics and ask you to tell me the story about your first encounter with astrology through books oh my gosh well i mean and i'm so interested in hearing kind of like your developmental story on this too literally my first encounter with astrology through books um was 
very much kind of like coffee table format. Literally Linda Goodman's books that my mom owned, right? Like, so um, I have actually a newer copy, not the ragged copy um, with like the decaying skeleton spine and stuff. Yeah. Wow. Linda Goodman Sun Signs, how to really know your husband, wife, lover, child, boss, employee, yourself through astrology. That's a lot of capitalism on that cover. Look at that. <laughs> husband, wife, lover, employee, boss. Like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably how they sold like a, a trillion books or however. It's over two million copies sold, apparently. Here we um, go. On the back cover of the hardback yes! is a lovely portrait. Do you wow. remember that? Like that literally is like seared into my memory as a child, that that portrait of Linda Goodman. This is what astrologers look like. <laughs> oh, so yeah. so when you had these books sitting around as a younger person, what was it like? Did you did you get into it? Did you feel resonance with what Linda was saying? Oh my God, I still get body chills as you ask that question. Absolutely 5 million percent. I, I And not this time, right? So I'm eight years old. I don't know really the, the technical aspects of anything that I'm reading, right? I know that I'm a sun cancer. Don't know my moon sign. Don't know my, you know, ascendant or anything like that. But I really kind of was like reading and engaging for all the sun signs that I actually knew. Like myself as a cancer, did I resonate 1 million percent? Um, my mom, Leo, yes. My my Gemini grandmother, who's also from Germany, which is interesting. Yes, did I resonate? Absolutely. So it was kind of like this like interesting um, immersion into kind of the characters that I knew in my life as a time as a child um that's kind of how it lived for me at the time so it has it persisted in your work today I mean did that foundational exposure give you I'm I'm asking that question because you're the horoscope writer for the mountain astrologer and Linda Goodman sun signs is ostensibly the most popular sun sign book ever written so is it still with you yeah, and it'll never die. And that's such a trippy question. I love your questions, Jen. Like, all goosebumps. Because, like, it, this is so moving for me. So, yes, I'm the horoscope writer for the Mountain Astrologer. Like, the best astrology magazine in the world right now. It's amazing. And, like, it's a trip how, like, the universe kind of, like, converges to create the human that you are. Right. Because like at the time, did I think that I would be a horoscope writer when I was eight years old reading Linda Goodman's Sunside books? Absolutely not. Like, but I am one. So it definitely like kind of like cultivated that. I also oddly, one of my greatest astrology teachers, Bob Glasscock, he was really good friends with Linda Goodman. In fact, she transferred all of her clients to him in the 60s and 70s. And he was my horary teacher and my solar arcs teacher. And like, it's, it's kind of like, even through from other dimensions, different like timelines and scales, like Linda Goodman has totally shaped who I am. Other thing that is interesting about this is like, even beyond books, like my, my grandmother was like a tabloid reader, right? So like, literally also you know, a formative thing with astrology was reading horoscopes in magazines, like period, every day, every week. And um, so, yeah, like it's, it's such a trip how like directly formative all of this was in terms of my actual professional role right now. That's amazing. That is amazing. So I guess another takeaway would be, be careful what you lay around your coffee table around the kiddos, <laughs> right? <laughs> I would second that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, so here's the big question. If you were stranded on a desert island, maybe the island doesn't need to be a desert. If you were stranded somewhere and you could only take three astrology books with you, what would they be? Mm. 
Okay, that's like literally the hardest question that can ever I know it's hard. I know how can you pick just three when there's like, you know, 3,000 that you'd want to have at your disposal, but really, like just the top, the top three. Yeah, like I think I would take, I would probably just, I would probably take Reinhold, uh, Everton, anything with me. Um, the combination of stellar influences and also his fixed st- uh, star. Um, book or tome just because it's so interesting I like the cosmobiological kind of like you know reference point I think it would just be like cool to know and also um this classic book The Secret Language of Relationships by Gary Goldschneider and Juiced Effers because um literally there's like no kind of end to what you could possibly like look into while you're trapped on a deserted island so how i've not seen that i've seen it that secret book of relationships but what is the structure of it that makes it endless when you open it up okay well first of all there's like literally 800 pages of book it was giant thing um so here's the structure so you have like actually um every single astrology sign is broken down in decans right so we have like a week um and this is your personality if you're born in this week etc and then we have like the synastry component where it's like there's hundreds of pages of like week on week how you would relate to this person born into this week and then there are I mean this tone this book was just so well done right because they found like actual relationships for every single description that these people wrote wow um yeah so I mean that's why you you're really not gonna get bored like even if you meet a lizard you know and (laughs) somehow you discover like its birthday Like, you can figure out how compatible you are as homies on your desert island. I love that. Lizard astrology. (laughs) See? Yeah. Hybrid freak (laughs) isn't wrong, right? Another question, (laughs) like, coming to me is, like, you have, on the one hand, the cosmobiological harmonic slash vibrational school, and then on the other, this expertise in sun sign work, which to me seems, Mm -hmm. like, when you say on the, like, at the beginning, the zodiac is only 1%. But then when we look at the tropical zodiac and sun sign culture, it's everything. It's like 99%. So that's Mm -hmm. a really cool like engagement that you have because you're covering all the bases, just not all at once. Mm. Anyway, just appreciating you. Okay, so that was the two books. I guess three. Technically, you have two Everteens and one relationships, right? Yes. And there goes my dog. Sorry. No worries. I'm going to pause for a sec. Ah! dog welcome dog hello um okay so the other thing i think that's neat about combination of stellar influences this is the modern version and then one of the first printings looks like this um there's the no text on the cover or that's only text on the cover no images um but combination of stellar influences is like okay we've got mercury venus midpoint compared to all of these other factors and you know other planets that might be at the middle of that midpoint or whatever so you kind of have this plug and play that would take a lifetime to truly ingest and have inside you as a like knowledge, right? Yeah, and absolutely. Hold on, I'm picking up my copy to kind of like um, piggyback on what you just said. Yeah, and it's like you're introducing the midpoint angle that I think is kind of like the lost angle when we're talking about like hybrid freak astrology, like. (laughs) <laughs> one element of this is just kind of like um in my opinion just like really mastering specific esoteric techniques like like midpoints like you know other stuff mm-hmm. so when you say the lost angle can you f- explain more about what you mean by that yeah so I feel like with I'm actually getting to know myself in such a different way talking to you, Jen, because like, I think I'm like this all like super esoteric astrologer, like on the cutting edge with harmonics, but like, actually, like, 
I am a sun sign astrologer as well. So like now I don't know who I am anymore, but like, so for example, like I think that most astrologers, when we're in a sign sign analysis conversation, like we're not thinking of direct midpoint structures and how like, how, you know, the angular distances between certain planets, how they cut each other up, how they like slice each other down and vice versa actually changes the resonance or the glow or the impact of what we're interpreting at any given point. And that's what like midpoints do, period. Mm -hmm. So the, there's a way of, um, I mean, cause when you say also the going back to that very first statement around vibrational and getting into this quantum level, like when you look at a chart, knowing midpoint structures as deeply as you do, can you start to see them without calculating? Can you just look at the angles and start to see these hidden features? Wish I could. Um, at times, I think I'm kind of gangster like that, but something <laughs> not not every time. No, yeah. like I'm gonna have to look at the midpoint listing. Period. Right. Yeah. 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 I think it's really cool how that technique began or got like revived ish and improved upon um, because of trying to be, I love the way the Germans put it. It's like sensitive. So we have the word vibration. Wow. We've got sensitive points, right? Like there's this point in the Zodiac that would respond to all those things that you're talking about, these angles, cutting things up. And it's like, you know, in that midpoint picture, there's going to be a, a place that isn't occupied by something. Right. And when something moves into that point, then suddenly a whole vibe gets unleashed. Like, whoa. Ooh. So, you know? Yeah, and Sensitive. you can feel it. Yeah. You can feel it. Just like you just, like, literally when you were just, when you said the word unleash, like, I feel it, like, in my actual body. That's like the, the I think that's the interpretive qualitative difference as well is just especially with midpoints is just the the energy of it mm -hmm. the sensation you know yeah yeah and i also love how you're able to have multiple styles of astrology in your fluency because i think that is the hallmark of you know being truly in this field and being able to say to yeah. say like oh i'm going to go on to the vibrational level now i'm going to be shuttling off to the sun sign level now i'm at a conference now i'm the president of isar whoa Congratulations, by the way, you just got elected to be the president of ESAR. Thank you. Well, that is so I mean, cool. It's, it's an honor and it's definitely an honor working with you too. Like you're so super brilliant. Like we're just fire. So total fire. <laughs> no earth. No, <laughs> but I've been thinking a lot about earth and like this idea of sensation and how as astrological practitioners, these books, like the the structure of combination of stellar influences to stick with that title for a moment, whenever I see it laid out and I'm reading in there, to me, it seems like the skeleton upon which we can hang a lot of interpretive power that isn't articulated exactly there, but it, uh, it like allows us to like fully unleash. I say that that word comes up again, unleash something, but how is it for you when you're, do you sit and read this one or do you reference it? Like, what's your relationship to Kosi? It's kind of more like reference, you know? And I wonder what your journey is too, like as a professional astrologer as well with your books now. Mm -hmm. Like, like at the beginning, they were like structural pillars to wit to like form your own voice like to yeah. form your own analysis like absolutely critical like total skeletal type of things and now it's just like the ability after you know thousands of hours of obsessively practicing yeah now it's like these these books not like they're relegated to to you know obsolescence because they'll never be but now they're just kind of like, mm, oh my God, they're just, they're almost like treasures on the bookcase that remind you when you were starting and now you can read the hell of, out of a midpoint, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think 
I think the change comes when you start to disagree with them. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Like there's a worship phase of like, wow, I yeah. love this book. And then, and then you go to a conference and you talk to somebody who practices something different or they teach you something. And it's that human to human transmission, assuming we're all human. <laughs> um, <laughs> Not sure um, about it. Some of us might be meteorites, you know? Um, yeah. And then, <laughs> and then you get this download of a different way. And then you go back to that book and you're like, no, <laughs> you know? And then that begins this whole, and then it starts falling apart and you're like, I don't need these books. I know what I'm doing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I completely commiserate. What a beautiful way to put it, Jen. Yeah. yeah. No, this this library is filled with books that are all arguing with each other, just like we do yeah. at conferences. Like, no, 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 you have to calculate it with the <laughs> Nibod mark arc distance angle, like whatever that is, you know. Um, it's like that's not do you precess <laughs> your your progressions, you know? <laughs> what about and my thing, my my biggest thing, I know I've said this on another uh episode here is converse. I recently mm -hmm. learned that Converse, by reading a book, it was Martin Ganston's Primary Directions, that Converse wasn't always what we think of when we say the word Converse. Mm. Instead of thinking about it as backwards, like Converse progression meaning backwards in time is some as forwards in time, it just mm -hmm. means in the context of primary directions, taking a significator to a promisor versus a promisor to a significator. Hmm. But they never imagine that time's moving in reverse. Wow. You know? What? That is <laughs> yeah. a trick. I know. <laughs> so that's why I love the books now. That's what I would say. It's in my relationship with it is, like you were saying, with these more esoteric techniques, like I want to go to those conversations where people are like thinking about things like, is time moving backwards? Can we say something meaningful about a converse <laughs> progression? Of course you can. If you look and you have a human brain, you can create meaning out of anything, right? I mean, that's why we have mm -hmm. so many beautiful kinds of astrology, 15 different sets of degree symbols, right? But, you know, um, here we are. Yeah, and I love that. And, you know, like, I love that we have the capacity as like masterful professional astrologers to have debate, to have, you know, like critical analysis. That's the only way that we're going to grow, you know, as like a community. Um, and it's fun. I, it's, it's, it's so fun and exciting to, to actually kind of like sink teeth into why somebody employs a technique or, or defines something like, the way that they define it and etc. So I'm, I, you know, I'm all for it. I would be so bored without this, this kind of like, what is, um, I'm pulling on your knowledge now, Jen, like what I'm thinking of pandemonium, but it's like totally not, not the right word. Like when back in ancient society, when people just came together and just had dialogue, like scholars, what's the a name symposium. of that? A symposium. Symposium. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, our conferences are kind of like that. But I go back to Demetrius Bagley always asking, this was about 10 years ago, he was saying, is there a way we can gather differently? And I don't think we've sufficiently yep. answered that question yet. Mm, so. Well, I think we're probably going to like really kind of make waves on that and Pluto and Aquarius as astrologers because we are going to be gathering um super super weirdly outside of the conference model yeah, I believe I hope so I hope so and having symposia or 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 <laughs> yeah. you know, our colleague Kent by with his in engagement with virtual reality having an endless conference in the virtual sphere where you can just tune in and oh. be in this virtual space of like well what about that you know arc distance calculation da -da -da. yeah <laughs> cool okay so if you were to i got two versions of this question because i want to i want to know if i was going to begin with vibrational astrology where would you send me first is there a book that i should start with to learn vibrational astrology well, to learn vibrational astrology, I think that there are some reference books that kind of break down, you know, what harmonics mean um, and kind of planetary pairs. But if I'm honest with you, they're not my favorite books. 
It's just like when we were talking about earlier, like we're now I just don't agree. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. So I wouldn't like I wouldn't send them to yeah. Like okay, I have to yeah. I have to stop you right there because that's the book you have to write. Uh, I'm just gonna call yeah. it. I'm calling it in public. That's the book that needs to be written. Is the Clarissa Dolphin version of getting into vibrational astrology from Jump. Uh, uh, quit. Well, sorry. Like I was about no to pressure. answer. And- <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I feel that I actually totally feel like the cosmological pressure of the universe of that declaration and, and statement, Jen, in the best way. Thank you very much. I'm totally taking it on. Give me two years. It's all right. All right. Out. Okay, yeah. okay. That dovetails with. Yeah. All right. Cool. So and then just for anyone getting into things from no base of knowledge whatsoever if there was somebody where you so they come to you and they say I really want to get into astrology what do you tell them which books do you point them to definitely anything Robert Hand. so like planets in transit period this is just gonna this is your starter book um if you're just trying to get into astrology and figure out I think the mountain astrologer magazine is also an excellent reference point just to like what other books are really good um, for for starters? I would not recommend anything by Mark Edmund Jones for starters. I love like, that you said what you wouldn't recommend. That is so cool. <laughs> Do not read Mark Edmund Jones if you're beginning. <laughs> you know what's crazy? I, I did, though. Dane Rudyard has an astrological wow. mandala, which is based upon the Sabian symbols that Mark Edmund Jones came up with. And so I did cut my teeth on that a little bit, but that was, it was through the frame of Dane Rudyard though. So why do you think someone needs to stay away from Mark Edmund Jones? Oh, well, because I think Mark Edmund Jones is, is um, not palatable in, in the way that perhaps, you know, later astrologers like Dane Rudyard are to kind of like the modern mind. Like, for example, his horary, Mark Edmund Jones' horary astrology books are basically like LSD. Like they're straight up like acid astrology or something. If you don't know about like, he introduces triads. He totally, you know, demolishes kind of classical ideas of how to apply horary astrology, etc. Like, you're not going to know, even like, even now, I don't know what he's talking about. So that, not, like, that's probably why you don't want to kind of start there. Start with Linda Goodman. Start with Dane Rudyard. Start with, you know, Robert Hands. Like, keep it simple. Right. Be careful where you begin is what I'm hearing. And you know what, Jen? You have to know. I say fooey on that and just start where you start, right? Like yeah. coffee table, coffee table formative situation. You know, my mom had Linda Goodman. Probably your kid probably has like every single cool project title hindsight. The last five- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Um but then they rebel, right? So like, you know, it's like, oh, you're sitting around an entire out of print copy of Project Hindsight. What does she want to do? She's mm-hmm. going to go off and do karmic astrology, right? <laughs> not saying they're bad. I'm saying they're not in the same area of the field. So, <laughs> right? So very cool. Um, Yeah. And is there any book that you have a feeling about that you want to share with people? Or have we pretty much covered the terrain so far? Like, is there just one last title that you just want to shout out and let people know about because maybe not enough people know about it? Well, yeah, like, actually, so this is so I'm outing myself as a horary astrologer now to this book, Horror Astrology Reexamined by Barbara Dunn. This is a good title. If you want to actually like practice horary and apply it, like this is going to really help you out. Um, But there's so many books. There's like Demetra George has 5 million books that are awesome. Chris Brennan, you know, how many other authors, like we can just be talking about this for like 7,000 hours, listing title after title after title. You know, I, I just, I feel like this, 
one discussion could never do justice to how many good astrology books there are out there. It's very true. It's very true. Okay. Well, thank you for taking time today to share with me some of the top of the pops for you. And congratulations on all the amazing things that you're doing in the world of astrology. You're super critical to all of the cool things that are coming up as well. And yeah, thank you, Clarissa. Thank you, Jen. And ditto, you're the most awesome person in astrologer period. So I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you. Talk soon.